Well, the whole point of this convention was if we had spent all of this time and effort getting all of these people to the trial, let's open it up to the public. Let's share all of this knowledge with the people. Every day in my oncology practice treating cancer patients, I see patients suffering from nausea, loss of appetite, pain, insomnia, depression. I can tell those patients, try one medicine instead of prescribing six or seven different medicines, all of which may interact with the chemotherapy I prescribe or with each other. And I ask all of my cancer patients, what brings you joy? And the number of people living with cancer who tell me that gardening brings them joy is not insignificant. I think if you feel that you're dying or part of you has died, that the ability to bring life out of the ground is a blessing. And for patients who can grow their own medicine, that's very empowering. Cannabinoids don't seem to be particularly effective in increasing appetite. Everybody says, well, what does that mean? And I say, well, no studies looked at cannabis, the whole plant. I think that's the issue. The plant is the medicine, not isolated compounds that are put into sesame oil and produced by pharmaceutical companies. Nature did it best. A lot of this is based on reefer madness and hysteria, and I always say that cannabis has been a medicine 3,000 years for a lot longer than it hasn't been a medicine 75 years. And it's one of the safest, uh, uh, if you look at it compared to the other medications that we prescribe as physicians, it's quite safe. The criminalizations are really a manifestation of the 20th century. And I think as we are now in the 21st century, we need a 21st century cannabis policy. And that should be about the, sp about the responsible legal regulation of this plant, about allowing people to use it without being punished, about allowing people to grow their own at home if that's what they want to do, and about allowing businesses to grow it in larger amounts and sell it and be regulated and to pay taxes. That's what makes sense. The best way to think about cannabis, and for that matter, the other things like coca or opium, is that they're essentially global commodities, very much like alcohol and to tobacco and sugar or coffee and tea. And the fact is that whenever you have a substantial demand for something, there's going to be a substantial supply. So the notion of relying on punitive prohibitionist laws and police and prisons to try to regulate what's essentially a global commodities market is absurd. It's why in the United States and Canada and Uruguay and increasingly in Europe, we see a movement away from prohibition and the direction of legal regulation and taxation of this commodity. It seems to me it makes the same sense in South Africa and really throughout this continent to move in that same direction. Why should South Africa be spending millions or hundreds of millions of rand each year to arrest people for using or possessing or selling or growing daha, right? Why should they be, but why should they be, you know, spraying chemicals on plants? Why don't they just move forward in the direction of legal regulation, earn the tax revenue, turn this into a legitimate industry in the same way that other countries are doing? But the most surprising thing is that the tax revenue is far exceeding everybody's expectations. Already state governments are bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars a year in tax revenue. And in the United States, that tax revenue, because we helped to draft the laws, is specifically dedicated for things like school construction, for policing, for youth programs. So the money's being well spent instead of spending it on police arresting young people for low-level cannabis offenses and putting them in jail or prison. What I would say to the South African government is you did a wonderful job getting an up-to-date constitution that puts human rights and individual freedom at the heart of your constitution. It's a world-leading constitution. In fact, it's allowed us to take this case to court. So why don't you now do the same thing with your drug laws? Why don't you turn your drug laws into rational evidence-based pieces of legislation that you can lead the world in that as well? 
Your drug laws, unfortunately, are very similar to my drug laws in the UK. They're all based on the, the false premise that criminalization reduces use, when of course it increases use, particularly of more dangerous drugs. They're all based on this outmoded American model that's perpetuated through the UN. We need to radically reform our drug laws. Other countries have done it. Netherlands with cannabis, Portugal with all drugs, Uruguay with cannabis. We can do it. We know it works. We know it, we know it reduces the cost to society. It massively increases the research potential on drugs. It's a win-win-win. Why not do it here in South Africa? We've got good examples of rational policies, particularly around cannabis. The best one's the Dutch. The Dutch have the coffee shops, people who can get cannabis in different strengths, different variants to use recreationally or medicinally. They also have medicinal cannabis, medicinal cannabis so doctors can prescribe it. So, so Holland is a, a wonderful example. Why did the Dutch do that? Why did the Dutch set up the coffee shops? They did it to stop young people going to dealers. They knew that if young people went to dealers to get their cannabis, they would always be offered heroin. And they wanted to stop the heroin market. So they gave young people easy access to cannabis in coffee shops. And they didn't have to go to dealers. And they had this remarkable success. And it, there are very few young Dutch heroin addicts because they don't ever meet a dealer, so they never get interested in the drug. So that's a perfect example of how a policy has enormous health benefits. All over the world, hoping that one day soon will be growing. We've been involved in selling hemp products and promoting the use of industrial hemp for the last 21 years now. And hemp refers to the non-psychoactive uses of cannabis, your fiber, your food products, your building materials, the biomass. And what I, what was, I was doing at the cannabis convention is showcasing the bigger health aspects. Because everyone looks at this plant for healing once you're already sick. But there's a whole other side to it, which is it can help prevent you getting sick by providing you with your optimum ratio of omega fatty acids for your body, which help your immune system run properly by providing you with really good digestible protein that your body can absorb and keep your whole system nice and strong to fight off disease. And then also wearing hemp is breathable, it's natural, it doesn't have pesticide residues on it, so wearing the natural fiber is also more healthy. Living in a hemp house is a building that breathes, that has humidity regulation and thermoregulation, that's also more healthy. So it's just looking at the bigger picture of one plant that can provide you with healthy materials to lead a healthy lifestyle that will prevent you getting sick. And if you do happen to get sick, there's a whole medicinal side that's going to help heal you as well. So I was there to tell the full picture of jobs, houses, food, medicine, all from a plant that grows three to four months, would love our climate, would love our country, would enable our people to have jobs, sustainable livelihoods, take us from junk status to green status.